The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Targeting Interleukins to Improve Treatment Outcomes in Atopic Dermatitis. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash FRX 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello, this is Lakshi Aldridge. Welcome to this educational activity on targeting interleukins to improve treatment outcomes in atopic dermatitis. Joining me in this discussion is my friend, Dr. Leo. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Our goals for today is to explore the severity of AD across different patient populations, considering the chronic and heterogeneous nature of this disease. To enhance your understanding of underlying pathophysiologic processes that contribute to the development of AD and the rationale for the use of targeted biologic therapy. We also hope to provide tools for selecting the appropriate treatment for patients with moderate to severe AD with a goal of minimizing and preventing flares. There's approximately 9.6 million children in the United States younger than 18 years that have AD, and about a third have moderate to severe disease. Approximately 16.5 million U.S. adults, which is about 7.3%, have AD that initially began after age two, with nearly 40% affected by moderate or severe disease. The disease course of AD is chronic but intermittent, and when active, the intense pruritus and rash can truly be debilitating. The burden of symptoms can be profound, as can the impact on quality of life, particularly when you have moderate and severe disease. And this includes effects with depression, anxiety, and sleep disturbance, which are frequent comorbidities of AD. The distribution of atopic dermatitis can vary by age. So in infancy, from birth to two years, we typically see AD lesions appear on the face, including the cheeks, the scalp, and the ears, as well as the extensor extremities, and there can appear to be an overlap with seborrheic dermatitis. In childhood, from two years to puberty, we see it again on the face, including the cheeks and the flexural extremities. And then in teenage and adulthood, we see it more localized to the flexural extremities. We also see hand involvement and dorsal foot involvement. The diagnostic features of AD can include some essential features. The key features are that chronic itch and then these eczematous patches, which can appear acute, subacute, and chronic. And the typical morphology that I just reviewed can vary depending on your age. And it has this classic chronic and relapsing history. Again, the patterns include the face, necks, and extensor involvement in infants and children. And current or prior flexural lesions occur in any age group. And the interesting feature of AD is it tends to spare the genital and axillary regions. Some important features associated with AD is the early age of onset. Remember that this disease we typically see in infancy and early childhood. There can also be a history of atopy with family members who have this, as well as an IgE reactivity. And then xerosis, dry skin, because this disease definitely involves skin barrier disruption as well as lipid barrier dysfunction. Some associated features of atopic dermatitis that can suggest the diagnosis, but are too nonspecific to be actually used for the defining of AD, but we consider this in research and epidemiological studies, include an atypical vascular response. You can see facial pallor, white dermatographism, and then you can see a delayed blanching response. You can also see keratosis pilaris or pityriasis alba, And then you can also see this feature of hyperlinear palms, which is more prominent in darker skinned individuals. And then ichthyosis associated with that really dry skin. You can also see ocular and periorbital changes. You can also see other regional findings, perioral changes or periauricular lesions. And then you can see perifollicular accentuation. You can see lichenified plaques and you can actually develop perigo lesions. 
There's lots of differential diagnosis with this disease, including scabies, seborrheic dermatitis, ichthyosis, as I mentioned, but things like cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, psoriasis, other immunodeficiency diseases, and erythroderma of other causes. AD can appear differently in different skin tones. So in lighter skinned individuals, you can see these pink patches, for example, in the popliteal fossa. You can also see these pink erythematous like kinified patches, um, descriptive of chronic scratching or itching. Atopic dermatitis in patients with darker skin types can have very different appearance. It can look more follicular with lesions looking more papular and numular. The, the erythema or redness is much more obscured, looking more violaceous, dark gray, even brown black. There's prominent lichenification, as you can see in these images, and there's dispigmentation that can often be permanent. And interestingly, atopic dermatitis is more common in darker skinned individuals. Now in mild atopic dermatitis, you see these hyperpigmented or even hypopigmented uh, lesions, and it can just occur uh, appearing as pink skin. There's really no crusting or oozing. It, you don't have swollen or demitous appearing skin or even thickened skin. So these are the appearances of mild atopic dermatitis. In moderate atopic dermatitis, you're going to see more dull, reddish skin. The lesions appear more swollen or raised and even thickened or lichenified. You can see mild oozing and crusting may be present, but this is less so. Now, in severe atopic dermatitis, you really see bright or erythematous deep red skin or violaceous skin. The skin appear, may appear swollen. You see raised lesions and plaques. You can even see thickening of the skin. You see oozing and crusting, which may be present associated with those secondary skin infections. And the rash tends to be more widespread, affecting more of the body surface area. So in clinical trials, there are various tools that we use to assess the severity of atopic dermatitis, and these are listed here. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I just want you to be aware of them. And some of the most common ones that we use are the easy score or the eczema area surface, uh, severity index, the POEM, which is also a, a common tool that assesses severity, and then SCORAD. Other tools that we use are, are the Dermatology Life Quality Index, and this really helps patients identify a lot of the features that affect their quality of life associated with skin conditions such as atopic dermatitis. Again, remember one of the hallmarks of this disease is pruritus or itch, so they use the pruritus itch score, which is very important, using a visual analog scale, which helps them to rate their itch for the past 24 hours on a scale from zero, which is not present, to 10, which is the worst itch imaginable. So another objective assessment of atopic dermatitis is the uh, Validated Investigator Global Assessment, or the IGA scale. It's a scale that's really much more practical in our clinical everyday life, ranging from clear, completely clear skin is zero, to severe skin, which is four, that you see that marked erythema or deep bright red skin. You see induration, papulation, lichenification. So this is much more practical and this is really what we use in our uh, daily clinical lives. So what about comorbidities? We know there are comorbidities associated with psoriasis. What about in atopic dermatitis? This is a really nice article that looked at the association between atopic dermatitis in adults and atopic and immune-mediated conditions, and there is data to support that there does seem to be an association. So there's ample evidence supporting the association between AD and mental health conditions such as depression, anxiety. There's limited but some evidence supporting a link between AD and adverse bone health disease or bone health outcomes. And there's some controversial data that supports the association between atopic dermatitis and cardiovascular risk factors, including hypertension, myocardial infarction, and stroke. Again, there's a lot more data and research that's being done in this field, so stay tuned. But just be aware that this is definitely something we need to pay attention to. So now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Peter Leo, who's going to talk to us about really understanding the underlying mechanisms. Peter? 
Thank you. That was a wonderful introduction into some of the pathophysiology and the presentation clinically that we're going to see for this condition. Now I want to delve into some of the mechanisms of disease and how that might pair us up with some targeted therapies. So we understand that atopic dermatitis often occurs as part of a broader picture of atopic disease. And sometimes this is referred to as the atopic march, where people tend to start with, with eczema or atopic dermatitis. Then they often go on to develop food allergies, then asthma, and then things like allergic rhinitis. Now, of course, not everybody develops these, and some people will get different ones at different times. But we do think there is something to be said for this progression. And part of the concept that I think is so exciting is that it may be that eczema, that damage skin barrier opens the door for these other allergic diseases. So the stakes are really high. We know this is a terrible condition. It has a huge burden, as we've heard, but it's even more than just this disease. It's possible we could influence other allergic diseases if we can nip this in the bud, so to speak. We know that there is clearly a genetic component. Family history of atopic disease does increase the risk for atopic dermatitis. In fact, having one parent with atopic disease raises the risk about 1.5 fold and having both parents, it's three to five times the risk. So we know this is common, although it's certainly not invariable. Some patients really don't seem to have a family history and that can't explain everything. The other piece is that we know genetics are playing some role, but there's been this increase in the incidence in the last few decades. And so that tells us it's moving too fast to be genetics alone. And now we understand that environmental factors are clearly playing a role. And this chart kind of gives us a sense that there's a connection with genetics, but also the environment and all of these are coming together to result in atopic dermatitis. And some of the things we understand are that there are skin barrier abnormalities, things like being deficient in flagrin or ceramides or antimicrobial peptides. And also there's an immune side of this whole story, increased predilection to make IgE, increased sensitivity to allergens in general, kind of an overactive Th2 cytokine pathway. But this is my favorite figure. I think it summarizes is all of that complex data. And it puts them in a way that actually shows not only, not only what they're doing individually, but how they interplay with each other. And so we see at the top, we have the skin barrier issue. We know we have this leaky skin concept where water gets out too easily, but allergens and irritants and even pathogens can get in in an abnormal way. If we go counterclockwise, we have the microbiota being abnormal. So this dysbiosis state where the microbiome starts becoming abnormal, and we often see a growth of staph aureus. Now, staph aureus is trouble because it releases a number of toxins, things like alpha toxin and delta toxin. That can not only drive immune system, but it also directly can damage the skin barrier. So we have loops within loops. Then the immune system comes in to try to help. It's releasing a number of inflammatory cytokines, things that we know, IL-4, IL-13. And some of those things are also driving more inflammation they're also damaging the barrier and they're activating sensory neurons, giving us that sensation that we know and hate, that itch. And that, of course, is the final piece where people are scratching and rubbing at their skin, which literally physically is damaging the barrier contributing. Now, it's also important to know that because it's a vicious cycle, no matter where you start, you can fall into this loop. And I think this is often where we meet patients. All of these things are involved and they're really in trouble. And to me, it means that we sometimes have to think about multiple aspects. It turns out that some of the cytokines, even though we think of it as just being, you know, one cytokine, one thing, they can actually play a role in multiple facets of this pathogenesis. So it turns out that IL-13 is sort of in the middle of this whole story. It's, of course, released by immune mediators. So the inflammatory cells are releasing IL-13. But then it's playing a role on a number of these issues. It's affecting the skin barrier. It's affecting fibrosis of the skin, it's affecting immune cell recruitment, and it's even affecting the B cells in their IgE production. So one cytokine can actually cause a number of these different effects, like skin barrier effects, skin infection, predilection, inflammation, itch, and skin thickening, potentially all part of this story, which is really amazing. Now let's take a closer look at the role of IL-13 in the pathophysiology of atopic dermatitis with this animated 3D video clip. Atopic dermatitis is a chronic inflammatory skin condition driven in part by type 2 inflammation and the cytokine IL-13. In atopic dermatitis, Th2 cells secrete elevated levels of IL-13, which plays a central role in promotion of the characteristic skin barrier disruption, inflammation, skin infection, lichenification, and pruritus observed in this condition. Mutations in genes encoding proteins involved in the maintenance of the skin structure 
as well as reduced differentiation of keratinocytes, drive epidermal barrier disruption in atopic dermatitis. When keratinocytes differentiate in the presence of elevated IL-13 in atopic dermatitis, they have reduced expression of filigrin, which is associated with increased production of type 2 cytokines, as well as chemokines involved in the recruitment of eosinophils, innate immune cells associated with allergic inflammation. Elevated IL-13 in atopic dermatitis also inhibits the production of antimicrobial peptides by epidermal keratinocytes, resulting in increased susceptibility to skin infections, skin microbiota dysbiosis, and recruitment of additional immune cells to the site of inflammation. The secretion of proteins involved in collagen metabolism is altered in the presence of elevated IL-13 levels, contributing to thickening of the dermal layer and the formation of lichenified plaques characteristic of atopic dermatitis. Finally, IL-13 acts as a pyridogen by activating sensory neurons in the skin that are involved in chronic itch. Scratching may further disrupt the skin barrier, promoting infection and inflammatory responses. Given the role of IL-13 in the pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis, agents selectively targeting IL-13 emerged as a potential therapy. Lebrachizumab is a humanized monoclonal antibody that selectively binds to an epitope on soluble IL-13 that prevents heterodimerization of the two subunits of the IL-13 receptor, IL-13 receptor alpha-1 and IL-4 receptor alpha, without blocking IL-13 binding to the IL-13 receptor alpha-1 subunit. This prevents downstream JAK-STAT-6 signaling. Lebrachizumab does not prevent binding of IL-13 to IL-13 receptor alpha-2, a decoy receptor involved in negative regulation of IL-13 through internalization of the bound cytokine and does not lead to activation of STAT-6. Thank you, Dr. Leo. That was great. So let's talk about what a flare is. So in 2020, the European Task Force of AD find flare as acute, significantly worsening signs and symptoms of AD requiring therapeutic intervention. So the management of acute flares of AD require efficient short-term control of acute symptoms without compromising the overall management plan that targets long-term stabilization of the disease, flare prevention, and avoidance of those comorbidities or side effects. Effective management of flares prevents lasting skin damage. Remember, we talked about permanent um, uh, loss of skin color, skin tone. So some of the flare triggers include um, uh, alteration of the skin microbiota by scratching or the dry skin, skin barrier dysfunction, dysregulation of cytokine production, stressful life events, hormonal changes, including pregnancy, um, exposure to allergens, food allergies, hot and humid environment, dry and cold environment, physical exercise and sweating, sun exposure, and then irritating clothing or even irritating chemicals that we put on our body. The psychological impact of this disease cannot be underestimated. We know that billions of dollars are spent dealing with the psychological impact of our daily lives. So we know that patients with AD um, have reduced physical activity, they have impaired sleep, they have more sick days from work resulting in loss of income, um, they have more hospitalizations, depression and anxiety, their skin physically hurts, so there is definite pain, and there's a negative effect on their relationships with their loved ones and even their sexual function. So there's an evolving algorithm for patients with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. So in our moderate patients, the mainstay of treatment includes topical corticosteroids um, applied directly to the inflamed skin using medium to potency, high potency topical corticosteroids two times a day for about two weeks, and then once a day for one week, and then twice a week for hot spots. We also use low, top, low potency topical corticosteroids for sensitive areas, and then also we consider using calcineurin and inhibitors. And there's also crisoborol um, and also topical ruxolitinib that has been approved that are non-steroidals and really offer an excellent um, uh, option uh, for alternative for uh, topical corticosteroids, even in uh, sensitive skin areas. So the basic management is uh, topical corticosteroids, calcineurin and inhibitors, uh, crisoborol, ruxolitinib, and then adding also 
bleach baths that can help, and then strict moisturization. However, when we go to severe disease, we do all of those topical treatments, but then we need to think about next steps, especially if patients are not adherent to their topical treatments. Perhaps they may um, have frequent skin infections. They've been misdiagnosed. They may have contact allergies to their medications. So it's really important to refer those severe patients to an atopic dermatitis specialist. So then we talk about the systemic options that are available for patients. And then we look at phototherapy, which is um, uh, an exposure to narrowband UVB rays. Um, it can be costly, it can be time consuming, but then there are actual systemic treatments that we can offer. Dupilumab has been approved for patients six months of age and older. Trailokinumab has been approved for adult patients. Abrocitinib has just received approval for uh, young adults um, and down to age 12. Upadacitinib has been approved for folks 12 years of age and older. And then we have the traditional systemic immunosuppressants that we've used in the past. Cyclosporin was a great bridge drug to help get our patients through their flare and then to a biologic treatment. Methotrexate has been a mainstay of treatment. However, not a great option for our young women or those considering starting a family. Mycophenamine mycophenolate mofetil, same issue, azathioprine, and then systemic corticosteroids, again, not to be used long-term, but help as a bridge drug. So when those treatments um, are, are employed, they can help prevent those flare, flares. But when you are in a flare, you need to con uh, consider some other treatment options, and that can include wet wrap therapy, especially for, for our babies and little kiddos. And then for our really severe cases, we need to think about short-term hospitalization. Dr. Leo, will you take us through some of the mechanism of action of these specific biologics that we're getting approved for atopic dermatitis? Absolutely. I would love to. So we mentioned that there are a number of important cytokines that are playing a role, but it turns out that IL-13 is sort of at the center of this story. And it's particularly interesting because we have not one, not two, but three biologics that are all potentially targeting this IL-13 pathway. And they're a little bit different. Each one is slightly different. So we've had for the longest period so far, we've had dupilumab. That's the one that's now approved down to six month old babies. And that's been out since 2017 in the United States. That is actually an antibody that binds to the IL-4 receptor. So it's binding to IL-4 receptor alpha. And it turns out that that subunit of the receptor plays a role in both IL-4 and IL-13 signaling. So it kind of kills two birds with one stone, IL-4 and IL-13. Now, trilokinumab, it's also already approved in, in use in the United States for adults with atopic dermatitis. That one binds directly to the IL-13 cytokine itself. And you can see it here. So it's binding to just IL-13 and blocking its ability to bind to the receptor, a little bit different than the dupilumab. And, and thus, it also doesn't really affect IL-4. Lebrikizumab is not yet approved in the United States, but is close. I think all of the paperwork has been submitted, so we're just waiting on the formal approval. And that also binds to IL-13. But here's the interesting piece. They're not really the same drug because they bind at different aspects of that molecule. And what's really fascinating is Lebrikizumab binds in such a way that it, of course, it inhibits it from going into its normal receptor, but it allows it to bind to what's called the decoy or dummy receptor, whereas trilokinumab binds in a way that blocks both of those things. Now, what does that mean to us? We're not exactly sure, but we think that this could explain some clinical differences between the medicine. Another piece that we have not talked about here, but is important is to think about the binding and even the dosing. So there's different dosing regimens that we can use for these drugs. So they're not all me too drugs. I think that's the most important thing I want to convey. And it is very possible that a patient might have differential experiences and results with each one of these, even though they superficially look like they're kind of the same thing. What about the evidence? Well, there have been a number of trials with dupilumab. It's been out the longest. And some of the earliest trials that were the monotherapy were called SOLO1 and SOLO2. These are several years old now. And we can see a very nice improvement over the placebo group. And this is as, again, a monotherapy in patients with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. And here the endpoint was getting them to clear or almost clear on that investigator global assessment score or getting the 75% or better improvement on the easy, that eczema area and severity index. So we could see it did much better than the placebo group and was very exciting. It was our first biologic. Trelokinumab, 
came out in 2021 in the US sort of at the end of that year, but a little sooner in uh, a little earlier in Europe and the United Kingdom. And this one again is for adults. And we can see again, a very nice separation from placebo. So very effective medication. Now with both of these medicines, there are a number of common adverse events, but one of the most important ones I think that we see is this conjunctivitis. We actually see some redness, some irritation of the eyes. And that in my experience has been one of the more common things that we have to face with both of these. Uh, with both of those medications. Now, lebrachizumab is the one that is in its final, final phases here, hopefully before approval, uh, but we can see that it also did a great job in terms of meeting that IgA score of zero or one, getting patients clear, almost clear, or getting that easy 75. Now, the temptation is to compare across them, is just look at the number and say, well, is the number, who has the best numbers? But it's actually somewhat dangerous to do that because the studies are a little bit different. They're in different populations. Some of the way that they count things are a little bit different. So you can, you can be misled. And I think Ultimately, what we'll wait for is to see if there are some comparative trials or if they can do these Bayesian network meta-analyses to help us. But my, my instinct is that in terms of efficacy, they're all fairly comparable uh, in, terms of, in terms of their ability to get people better. And then in terms of safety, they also all do share some of those common, common side effects that I think we're going to be on the lookout for. So even lebrachizumab also does have a signal for conjunctivitis. And some might say, well, maybe it seems to be a little bit lower than in other studies. But again, I would say we want to be cautious because especially with small numbers in these phase two and phase three trials, it's difficult to really get a sense of what's going to happen once it's out in the world. But again, I think they're all very, very favorable in terms of their safety, especially when compared with their efficacy. And, and for me, and I imagine for you too, the biologics have been a game changer. So this has been exciting. Now, lebrachizumab has also been studied in combination with topical corticosteroids. So we were talking about things as monotherapy, and I think it's always important to see what a medication will do on its own. But in clinical practice, we tend to be, as you've already mentioned beautifully, using these in concert with topicals and typically topical corticosteroids. So in a 16-week randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, multi-center trial, had 108 men, 103 women, and this did include adolescents, so down to 12 years of age. Those patients all had moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. They were placed on lebrachizumab plus a topical steroid, or they were placed on a placebo with a topical corticosteroid, so a placebo shot. And we were going to look at the primary outcomes at 54 sites over four different countries. So this is very nice. And we can see getting patients to that clear or almost clear in the the true group that actually had actual lebrachizumab plus the topical corticosteroids, over 40% of the patients were able to get clear or almost clear compared to only about 20% of patients who were on the placebo shot plus the topical corticosteroids. When we look at EZ75, it's even more impressive. Almost 70% of patients were able to get 75% or better improvement in their EZ score. And, and to me, this is really important because this gives me a sense of what might be happening in my clinical practice. That's probably how I'll be using them for most patients. When we also look at that combination of getting the clinical improvement, easy 75, but also getting the symptomatic relief, getting a itch improvement of four points or greater improvement, we can see again, almost 40% of patients in this tough to treat group was able to achieve that with lebrachizumab plus topical corticosteroids. And again, we've alluded to the safety, very, very similar to what we're seeing in our other biologics for atopic dermatitis. One of the most important things I think is that conjunctivitis signal. We'll be watching for that. In general, though, some of the more concerning types of side effects that we're seeing with, with immunosuppressant drugs are not here. And it's really neat because the FDA has actually allowed these drugs to not be called immunosuppressants because they're so targeted. The biologics for AD, I think we would consider them more immunomodulatory or anti-inflammatory, but they really don't seem to have a broadly immunosuppressive effect. And this bears out with looking at their treatment-related adverse effects. Now, there's one more exciting one in the pipeline that I'm excited about as well, and it's called Nemolizumab. Mab. This is a monoclonal antibody against a totally different uh, subunit receptor. So this is for IL-31 receptor, which is sometimes called the master itch cytokine. So this is kind of a different take, and yet it's very important for atopic dermatitis and things like paragonodularis and other itchy conditions, we think. So this is another approach. The early data that we have, again, shows very, I think, very encouraging uh, improvement in the visual analogs scale for itch. We're seeing easy improvement. We're also seeing other measurements that are showing improvement, not only in the symptom of itch, but also in some of the clinical signs of inflammation. And I really do think that IL-31 is probably also involved in this inflammation. It's not just the itch cytokine. Now here, interestingly, we're not seeing 
any conjunctivitis. So now we're out on a different pathway completely, and there's not a signal for conjunctivitis. There are some of the things we see commonly with many of these medications, nasopharyngitis, upper respiratory tract infection, uh, increased CPK, things like that. But there is no conjunctivitis score. So I'm particularly interested in that group of patients maybe who suffered from conjunctivitis. We might have some new options. And I'll turn it over to you to talk to us a little bit about treatment selection and shared decision making. Thank you so much, Peter. So let's talk a little bit more about this. So shared decision making is really an important feature of how we approach um, decision making with our patients. So the definition is that it's an approach where clinicians and patients share the best available evidence when faced with the task of making decisions about how we're going to treat patients. It, and patients are supported to consider all options and then make an informed decision about the choice that they're going to make. So evidence-based medicine framework in clinical decision-making includes the clinician's judgment, the best available data, and then patients' values. Taking all of those things into consideration, you come to a conclusion about the best treatment for that patient. And there's different questionnaires that are available to assist you with this, but it's really an important aspect now of how we approach um, making decisions with our patients. That also involves evaluating the whole patient. We need to ask not only about their skin symptoms, but about the quality of life, including sleep, associated risk factors for comorbid conditions. Again, we talked about controversy around uh, risk factors for cardiovascular disease, but I think we all ask about hypertension, diabetes, and metabolic risk factors. Um, we look for mental health and psychosocial impact of the disease. We educate patients and their caregivers and our younger patients that includes their parents, but also even in Older patients who have this disease, they may have caregivers that need to be educated, and we need to really talk about ways to avoid those triggers or flares. So in summary, advanced practice providers are really a crucial part of the multidisciplinary team needed for optimal assessment and management of atopic dermatitis. Part uh, patients and caregiver education is critical in making that shared decision treatment decision, particularly when stepping from moderate to severe atopic dermatitis treatments and the use of the systemic medications that Dr. Leo so nicely presented. Those biologic therapies, which specifically target interleukin-4, 13, and 31 signaling have demonstrated efficacious and safe treatment options for our patients with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, including some of our youngest um, patients. The IL-4, IL-13 dual inhibitor dupilumab has been approved for treatment of moderate to severe AD in patients six months of age or older, and the IL-13 inhibitor trilocinumab is approved in adults. And other therapies targeting these interleukin interleukins are in development, and really we're very excited about those, including trilocinumab, lebrokizumab, and nemolizumab. We hope that this presentation has been helpful. I'd like to thank my partner, Dr. Peter Leo, for his excellent presentation. We hope this has been helpful and informative. This activity is certified by PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Remember to download the slides and practice aids. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash FRX 860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Lilly.